This is a short video on peripheral vertigo. Peripheral vertigo refers to vertigo that's caused by a problem with the vestibular system in the inner ear. These are the semicircular canals, which kind of help you with balance. And the most common causes of peripheral vertigo are these three up here, but I'll be talking about all of these causes uh, one by one. In contrast, there's central vertigo, which is caused by a problem in the central nervous system. This is a list of causes of central vertigo, but I won't be talking about these here. The semicircular canals connect to the central nervous system via the vestibulocochlear nerve. This is cranial nerve 8, and um, it has two components. It has a vestibular component from the semicircular canals and a cochlear component from the cochlear canals here. So um, a problem with the with the with cranial nerve 8 with the vestibular cochlear nerve can also cause vertigo. So let's start going through these one by one. Well first, before we do that, let's first define what we mean by vertigo. Um, when a patient comes in, they're not going to immediately tell you they have vertigo. They might mention they have dizziness. And uh, dizziness can mean a lot of things. Unfortunately, it's not very specific. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paper by a couple family docs, I think, that kind of went through what patients meant by dizziness on average, and it seemed like in 50% of cases, they actually meant vertigo. Patients were able to describe a spinning sensation or a false sense of motion that was consistent with vertigo. In about 15% of cases, they really meant disequilibrium, which is a patient feeling off balance. In another 15% of cases, they meant presyncope. Uh, the patients felt like they were blacking out, like they were going to pass out or lose consciousness. And in about 10% of cases, the patient really meant lightheaded, which is like a vague disconnection from your surroundings. So a uh, patient won't tell you they're feeling vertigo or feeling vertiginous symptoms unless they've had those before. They might tell you they're feeling dizzy, and it's your job to tease that out, tease out that they're having a spinning sensation or a false sense of motion that might indicate vertigo. Okay, now let's talk about the first one, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. The pathophysiology here is crystalline deposits or canaliths in the semicircular canals. Um, these are, uh, they, they're also called otoconia. They're displaced in the semicircular canals and they can disrupt the normal vestibular fluid flow. When they do that, one side of your face is gonna give you contradictory signals from the other side. And this will be interpreted in your brain as a spinning sensation or vertigo. The symptoms you get here are brief reproducible episodes of vertigo. You can also get rotary nystagmus and nausea, and they're triggered by head movement. These episodes last anywhere from seconds to about one minute, usually not much more than one minute, um, but they're triggered by head movement. So somebody will be lying down, and as soon as they move, they experience this, whatever, 30 seconds of BPPV, and then it goes away. The diagnosis is made clinically, usually with a story like, like what I just described. You can also do the Dix-Hallpike maneuver to trigger nystagmus, and that's something you can do in the clinic. You lie the patient down supine, and you have their head rotated 45 degrees, and that can trigger nystagmus. The treatment here is um, a little uh, unusual for um, clinic treatments. You can do this Epley maneuver. It's a canalith repositioning maneuver. It's essentially a series of steps in which you're trying to get these crystalline deposits to go back to right where they're supposed to be. Um, so you're moving the head in a, in a certain direction to, to get those otoconia out of the way. You can also use antihistamines just to help with the vertiginous symptoms. And uh, otherwise, if you don't do anything about it, it'll resolve spontaneously, but it, it might take a while and it can recur. So um, really this Epley maneuver is, is a good way to get rid of it. Next is Meniere's disease. The pathophysiology here is increased volume or pressure of endolymph in the semicircular canals. So inside these canals is endolymph, and if you have too high a pressure of it, you can end up with Meniere's disease. This is also called endolymphatic hydrops. The symptoms here are, again, episodes of vertigo. Um, this time they last about 20 minutes to 24 hours. You'll also have sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. The sensory neural hearing loss can start unilateral at low frequencies, and it can progress to all frequencies. So it starts um, low frequencies, progresses to all frequencies. The diagnosis is, again, clinical. You could do the Weber and Rhine tests with the tuning fork to confirm sensory neural hearing loss, and you should be doing regular audiometry to monitor it um, in a patient with Meniere's disease. The treatment first will start conservatively with lifestyle changes. You can restrict sodium, nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol. You might also use diuretics. We're not really sure why the diuretics work, but they seem to help. If that doesn't work, you can escalate to antihistamines, benzos, and antiemetics for acute episodes. And if that doesn't work, the, there is like an invasive option, the endolymphatic shunt um, can be placed if it's severe and intractable.
uh, Meniere's disease. Next is labyrinthitis. The pathophysiology here is inflammation of the vestibular nerve. That's part of the cranial nerve 8 that I mentioned earlier. So this usually happens as a viral process or a post-viral process. So a patient might describe having an upper respiratory infection about four weeks ago, maybe two to four weeks ago. Um, they'll have an acute episode of vertigo, nausea, vomiting, hearing loss, gait instability, and this can last up to several days. Um, one way to diagnose labyrinthitis, which is also called vestibular neuritis, is with an abnormal head thrust test. It's usually a diagnosis of exclusion, so you might want to do brain imaging to rule out other causes of vertigo, uh, like pontine stroke and tumors, as well as cerebellar hemorrhage or infarction. Those would be causes of central vertigo uh, before you diagnose somebody with labyrinthitis. Treatment for labyrinthitis is steroids. You ideally want to give these as soon as possible, within 72 hours, within three days. They uh, do help the labyrinthitis to resolve. Uh, it's possible that you have balance and hearing problems that are compromised longer term, though. You can also give meclizine for just acute relief of vertigo. Next one worth knowing is herpes zoster otakite. Uh, Oticus. Um, this is also known as Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. The pathophysiology here is reactivation of latent herpes zoster virus from the genticulate ganglion. It disrupts the facial nerve function. So the signs and symptoms that you'll see are kind of shown in this picture here. You'll have ipsilateral face pain. You can have facial, facial paralysis that shows you this asymmetry shown here. And you can have a dermatomal vesicular rash in the external auditory canal as shown here. The patient might also have auditory or vestibular problems like tinnitus and hyperacusis for the auditory symptoms and vertigo and nausea vomiting from the vestibular side if the, if the herpes zoster spreads to cranial nerve 8. You can also have systemic symptoms like fever, but that's relatively rare. Less than 1 in 5 people get that. The diagnosis for herpes zoster oticus is clinical mainly. Um, there's this triad, the ipsilateral ear pain, facial paralysis, and dermatomal vesicular rash in the auditory canal. That's pretty characteristic. Treatment here is steroids and acyclovir. If you give it within three days, it can help speed resolution and limit the adverse outcomes. Patients sometimes have residual face weakness, but if you treat them early, they're less likely to have that. You also want to protect the eye um, on the affected side with like artificial ears um, to make sure they don't damage their eye while their face is weak or droopy. Next is perilymphatic fistula, and I'll also mention semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome since the pathophysiology is kind of similar. The pathophysiology is trauma that breaks the otic capsule. So the otic capsule is the bony um, outside of the inner ear of the semicircular ducts and the rest of the inner ear. And if you break that, you'll have a fistula, a leakage of the perilymph, that's the fluid inside these canals, and you'll essentially transfer pressure to the outside. It often breaks at the oval and round windows, but it can break in other places, like semicircular canal dehiscence would be a break in the semicircular canals. The symptoms that this presents with is sensory neural hearing loss that's progressive. You also have episodic vertigo and nystagmus that's triggered by pressure changes. So again, if you have a, if you have a fistula between the vestibular system and the outside, and you have an increase in pressure on the outside, such as by doing a valsalva, um, by elevating in pressure, by sneezing, by coughing, by straining, then you'll have pressure that's transferred to the inside of the system, and that can trigger an episode of vertigo. There's another Tulio phenomenon that's worth knowing. You can clap or play a loud noise in someone's ear, and that'll induce nystagmus, um, which is essentially the same thing. A clap is a sound wave, high pressure, that's transmitted into the vestibular system, inducing nyst uh, nystagmus. So that'd be one way to diagnose it clinically. You can also do a CT scan that might show fluid around the round window. So if you see that on CT scan, that might be a sign that there's a perilymphatic fistula. The treatment for these people, you can start conservatively with bed rest, head elevation, and limiting activities that increase the inner ear pressure. So tell them to avoid straining, maybe give them uh, laxatives or Miralax just to help them uh, avoid straining on the toilet. If it's persistent, you can progress to having a surgical patch um, if, it's, if it's refractory but uh, that would require going in and actually patching up the broken otic capsule.
Lastly, these are some other things that are worth mentioning, worth knowing. A less common cause of peripheral vertigo is this Kogan syndrome. The pathophysiology here is uncertain, but it's thought to be autoimmune inflammation of the eye. Patients will have episodes of hearing loss, vertigo, nausea, vomiting, ataxia, and vision changes. You can diagnose it by doing a slit lamp exam and also inflammatory markers like CRP, ESR. There is a new MRI test that might be able to identify the autoantibodies, but um, that's currently being studied. There's uh, The treatment for this would be immunosuppressants such as steroids. A couple others that are worth mentioning, vestibular schwannoma or an acoustic neuroma. This is a Schwann cell derived tumor of the vestibular part of cranial nerve eight. It's a slow growing tumor. So it, it'll firstly affect your hearing. It'll cause unilateral hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, it doesn't always cause vestibular uh, problems and that's because it's a slow growing tumor. So you can kind of have central vestibular compensation. So uh, if it's a fast growing tumor, you might have vestibular symptoms, the vertigo, the dizziness, uh, but usually the body's able to compensate for that and you don't have vestibular symptoms. If it's bilateral, you want to think about neurofibromatosis type 2, um, and uh, the diagnosis for this would be clinical. You would hear about somebody having hearing problems, maybe vestibular problems, but that's unusual. You can then do audiometry, find out that they have uh, asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss, and then confirm it with MRI. You'll see a mass in the cerebropontine angle. Treatment for that would be surgical resection or radiation. Lastly, there's aminoglycoside toxicity. This is interesting because gentamicin uh, and aminoglycoside is vestibulotoxic, so it can cause bilateral vestibular damage. However, because you have both sides damaged, because it's not unilateral, because it's bilateral vestibular damage, you're not getting conflicting inputs. So you're not getting a left-right imbalance of inputs. So you usually don't have vertigo, as we've been talking about it. You might have disequilibrium or oscillopsia, but you might not have vertigo with aminoglycoside toxicity. That being said, they can still have hearing loss, bilateral hearing loss from that. Um, the diagnosis here would be made clinically. You can do an abnormal horizontal head impulse test, and you might have reduced visual acuity during the head shake. So that was kind of a short overview of peripheral causes of vertigo. I hope it was helpful. Thank you for listening.